this is my life. I wish it went on forever, but for now, it's finite. It's also segmented. I have a lot of fun with my work, with my loved ones. These are the white parts that I think I will remember. But in between, there are these empty spaces, things that I don't even think I will remember, as if they didn't even happen. For 20 years of my life, I was doing the dishes every single day. I hated doing the dishes, and not because I'm lazy, not just, <laughs> but because of all the other things I could have done instead. Anyway, so now finally we have a dishwasher. But until recently, I was still doing some boring things in the office. For my work, I have to write a lot of programs, sometimes boring ones that I feel like a monkey could do, and emails that are so schematic that the machine could write them. Well, actually, now we have a machine that does. Artificial intelligence that we developed recently really changed how I do my job. What is my job? I happen to do research on artificial intelligence, so I'm here today to tell you a little bit about how AI works and what role it can have in your life. Among all the pieces of technology that we invented, uh, from stone tools, the control of fire, my personal favorite, the dishwasher, <laughs> AI is a special one. We always had our highest hopes and worst of fears related to it. Irving Good, Ellen Turing's friend and colleague, said, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last thing we ever need to invent. The old pioneers of AI were dreaming about machines that will finally invent everything for us and serve us to live our best lives. And yet, we find ourselves worried about people losing jobs, inequalities increasing, AI-generated misinformation littering our lives, some people worry that humans could completely lose control over AI. And I have my worries too. But here's what I think. There is a way to keep on top of things, and that is to keep learning. Only with learning about AI you will understand the real dangers and benefits of it. And I promise it will be a lot of fun because you will keep wondering, is this machine thinking the way I do, or is it doing something else? In the last 12 years, I studied both human and artificial intelligence, and I came to see that in most ways they are very different, but in some others, they became more similar. Let me explain. This is the evolutionary tree of intelligence, with the Homo sapiens vainly on top as a red dot. Now, in principle, there could be infinite other forms of intelligence that we do not possess, currently don't understand or not even know about. There could be forms of intelligence that uh, are simply incomprehensible to us. So where is current AI in this vast forest of possible intelligences? Well, some types of AI are right here. They are our cousins or colleagues. How do I know? For one, some types of AI are a little bit human-like in terms of how they learn. And for two, they are very much tied down to the human experience in terms of what they learn. At least a thin slice of the human experience. And that thin slice is the World Wide Web. You might have heard about DALI. Not this guy. <laughs> but the generative text-to-image AI developed by the research company OpenAI. DALI created all the visuals for my talk. That's pretty amazing, right? It created this image of itself as well, of course. This system was trained on millions of images online, photographs, paintings, graphic designs, created by thousands of artists and laymen. And so, what Dali knows about is really defined by what us humans found interesting enough to have uploaded to a website. And so, Dali will know about some very concrete things, such as plain old photos of zebras, let's say. And so, it can generate a novel, synthetic, but very convincing looking photo, like this one. It can also cook up and imagine very creative-looking, quirky images that are emulations of human artwork, like this one. However, if I simply ask Dali 
to just flip a normal zebra image for me, something that would be very easy to comprehend for a human. Dali just cannot do. The first time I tried, I got three horizons and five zebra legs. So that's not great. I tried again, and this time I got this bizarre zebra ham thing. <laughs> this is because Dali shares some of our plain visual experience of what the world looks like. But it doesn't share our common sense that lets us imagine what the world could look like. And so generative AI is limited currently because we are simply asking it to just emulate and blend images that we have created before. And human imagination is so much more than that. Now, there is one thing hotter currently than AI-generated images, and that is ChatGPT. So let's talk about language. I am not a linguist, so I don't know a lot about grammar, semantics, and so on. But there is a lot simpler aspect of language that the youngest of babies already pick up on. And that is that it comes in a sequence. Imagine that a baby's mother likes to entertain her with this nursery rhyme. The itsy bitsy spider climbed up the water spout. She's singing this all the time. Now, the next time the mother starts singing the itsy, the baby's brain already has a hunch that bitsy will follow. Technically speaking, her brain is predicting what comes next. And then it predicts spider, and so on. We found out that already newborns' brains are predicting sentences when psychologists used electrodes to measure their brain activity. And what they saw was that the brain activity suddenly changed if the sequence changed. We also know that babies pay specific attention to the important parts of sentences. For instance, here the word the is not very important because it doesn't tell us what comes next. The word uh, itsy is the one she has to pay attention to. The fact that the baby knows this means that she knows this word string, even though she doesn't understand the meaning of it at all. Now, the language models that are behind uh, ChatGPT and other AIs are like few-week-old babies. They are artificial neural networks they, that, they, uh, that look at a bit of text, and they try to guess what the next word is. And they don't know anything else about the real world. So they gradually learn what to pay attention to and predict the next word correctly. I use ChatGPT almost every day as a coding assistant, an algorithm that is writing and teaching me algorithms. It really feels like living in the future, at least when it works. It doesn't always get it right, but remember that the system at the core is just trying to guess what the next word is. And so it's mind-blowing how far we got with such a simple idea. I have to say I'm quite envious of you young people out there who start learning programming today. Because if you're stuck, you can just ask for instant help and explanations. And of course, it's not just programmers who can use ChatGPT as an assistant. If you have a white-collar job, if you're a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor, a journalist, you can have an AI assistant. But is this some sort of ultra-intelligence that is somehow beyond humans? Definitely not. A year ago, I gave ChatGPT this puzzle. You might have heard it before. A bat and the ball costs $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball, so how much does the ball cost? Do you know the answer? When I heard this the first time, my quick intuition was, well, 10 cents? But wait a second, if the ball is 10 cents, then the bet is supposed to be $1, so that it adds up to $1.10, but then the bet is only 90 cents more than the ball, so it just doesn't work. But let's see what ChatGPT said. 10 cents. It made the same mistake that I did. And of course, that cannot be a coincidence. Remember, just how um, image models were trained on images on the web, large language models are trained on text on the web. And our texts online are soaked with mistakes and lazy thinking. And so ChatGPT learns, learns to emulate the lazy thinking of humans. 
My colleagues at the Max Planck Institute showed that ChatGPT is prone to commit the same errors of thought that humans do across a wide variety of tasks. So this is a real issue. We don't want ChatGPT to be like a lazy human. We want it to be superhuman. And we are already one step closer to that. If you ask ChatGPT today, it will give you the right answer, which is five cents, by the way. How did we manage to make it so much smarter so fast? Well, it definitely helped that OpenAI released this language model, and so researchers and users all around the world were suddenly involved in this spontaneous, massive-scale experiment where anyone could try out the system and point out its strengths and weaknesses. Researchers at Google DeepMind uh, found out, for instance, that there is a way to make language models a lot better at reasoning tasks, which is to force them to follow a chain of thought. This is similar to what you would do when you get a puzzle and you want to make sure that you get it right. You would try to break it down and do it step by step. It seems that they built in this principle into the system, and so now the full answer that it gives you is that it starts with coming up with a notation, then it rewrites the problem as an equation, and finally it arrives to the correct solution. So that is great. But of course, not all the work is done here. There were even more serious issues, such as uh, inaccuracies in matters of high importance and even uh, toxic and harmful content. So OpenAI hired people to give direct feedback to the language model and basically show to it what are the kinds of things that are wrong and right to say. Because we realized that our common sense and our morals are not clearly written down in our texts. So we are still constantly teaching the language models. Language models are learning from us humans. Now, as long as we are training our AI on human data, it will evolve close to us as emulators of humans. But what if we don't tell AI what to learn? My colleagues and I work on this different type of AI that makes its own decisions and can act in the world. Think about how children learn how to act, how to walk, run, jump, play games. It's very rare that someone actually shows them exactly how to do these things. Most of the time, they just have to try and fail and try again and learn from the successes and gradually get better. Scientists call this reinforcement learning. For instance, imagine that you give a video game, a completely novel video game to a child. You don't tell him anything about it, you just let them play around with it for a couple of minutes or hours, and sure enough, they will figure it out. Now, playing video games may not seem as a serious business, but it is. Playing well prepares us for challenges solving problems of our everyday lives, but also solving big problems, such as preventing and curing diseases, sustaining life, life on our planet, and even exploring space. So it's been a crucial stepping stone to develop AI that can learn to play a game, at least, from scratch and on its own. Google DeepMind, a team at Google DeepMind, developed an AI that was based on artificial neural networks that enables it to learn how to see, and reinforcement learning that enables it to learn what to do. And sure enough, this AI was able to uh, learn to play a bunch of different games, and it got much better than humans on most of them. In fact, the video I showed you a moment ago, that was not human play, it was AI playing. And I want you to notice what it's doing exactly. It learns to hit the ball, of course, but it's also doing this really clever thing where it creates tunnels on the side so it gets the ball behind the wall where it just does the work by itself. Really clever. This is the best strategy that we know of in this game, and this AI found it all on its own. So this is really important. If we want AI that doesn't simply emulate and assist humans, but even surpass and inspire and mentor them. This is already happening to some extent. 
another AI that Google DeepMind developed called Alpha Zero mastered chess all on its own by playing against itself until it got astoundingly good, much better than any human and much better uh, than any chess engine that humans hand engineered to follow the strategies, the best strategies that we already know of. And then human chess players all around the world were watching the public matches that AlphaZero was playing. They were really inspired by some of these um, creative, surprising moves that it came up with. Then human chess players statistically started getting much better, much faster, partly because now they could learn from an AI that is thinking outside of the human box. Even the best chess player on the planet, Magnus Carlsen, learned and borrowed some ideas from AlphaZero. My hope is that we can develop AI that tackles real life challenges in ways we couldn't ever have. That's why my colleagues and I are working towards other than human AI. We need this AI if we want to tackle the most serious challenges in life uh, that keeps us from living longer and better. We need other than human AI that makes its own decisions, explores the world, gathers there his own data, develops his own language, and learns his own way rather than sticking to the human experience. Of course, such a system would raise even more safety issues than the current systems that we have. But we need such other than human AI if we want to go where humans by themselves cannot go. And until then, we will have our AI assistants. Now I want you to imagine that this is your life and the white segments are the things that you can uh, spend time on that you find important or fun or meaningful spending time with friends and family, making art, making food, doing science, you name it. Currently, AI cannot directly extend your lifespan, but it can give you more time within your lifespan. It enables opportunities, so make sure that you take them. Thank you.